Think of the greatest leader, born leader you've ever been around. Whether it was sports, business, or your personal life. What were some of the common themes, characteristics, and traits that really set this person apart, that made them special, made them seem like a unicorn? Today's guest learned so much from his parents growing up in Flint, Michigan, playing for one of the greatest college basketball coaches of all time, Tom Izzo, having a special career in the NBA and now serving as the leadership coach for the number one wholesale lender in the country and one of the fastest growing companies in America. We are so blessed to have him with us today. Welcome to At The Podium. Hello again, and welcome to At The Podium with Manuel Mesqua. As you now know, I'm a financial advocate, a CEO, husband, father, and massive sports fan. I'm obsessed with encouraging people to dream and attack the unique vision they have for their greatest life. And what we're trying to do is inspiring others to do the same. We built this podcast to share the stories of some of the highest performing people in my life and to help convert those stories into lessons you can quickly and immediately take away and implement to attack your own dreams. Today's guest knows a thing or two about dreams coming true. Mateen Cleaves, and I got to stare at this list, is a former three-time All-American guard at Michigan State University, Final Four MVP of the 2000 Men's Basketball National Championship team under Coach Tom Izzo, a retired NBA player who played six years in the league, 10 total, and now serves as the leadership coach at United Wholesale Mortgage. And again, United Wholesale Mortgage is the number one wholesale lender in the country, one of the fastest growing companies in the U S and led and served by one of the greatest CEOs I've been around in my entire life, Matt Ishbia. In our conversation today, Mateen's going to share stories about his time growing up in Flint, the impact and influence, great humans like his parents, coach Tom Izzo and Matt Ishbia have had on his life what it looked like to build to an unexpected at that time. You know, not being a powerhouse, but built to an unexpected 2000 national championship team in a few short years. And again, how he's taken some of those lessons now from Flint to the court, to the boardroom. He is easily recognized as one of the great leaders, not just in the state of Michigan, but in all of the U S and serving as the leadership coach at UWM. I hope you enjoy our conversation today with Mateen Cleaves. So Mateen, man, thank you so much for setting aside a little bit of time. I love the clips you put out about what it means to get your mind, right? Keep your grind tight. You are all over the country these days, (laughs) speaking, coaching, mentoring, being the rising tide and pouring into others, man. So thank you so much for being with us. Oh, man, I'm excited to be here, Manny. Come on, man. This, this is, <laughs> hey, you're not cool if you're not on the Manny show. Come on, baby. So I'm excited to be here, man. And, and I know I know it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Look, I want to jump right in. And I had my first question. And look, I was thinking about how many different versions of Mateen have existed in your very, very young life coming out of Flint, Michigan. But if we were sitting down with your 2000 national championship team, Coach Izzo, the key players on the team, the guys that you're the closest to, tell me how they would describe Mateen Cleaves at that time. (laughs) That's a great question. I I would think, and I would would hope, um, you know, most of them probably would um, describe me as, I mean, just 
selfless, you know, so selfless, um, cared about others like, um, like, like none other, um, uh, never was, it was, it was never about him. It was all about the team and winning and, um, the sacrifice. And, um, you know, he was probably a guy that was just willing to do whatever it took to win. That was it. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't care about stats or anything. So I, I would think that they would just say, man, you're talking about leadership, a guy that was so willed to win um, and, and actually went out of his way to care and help others. I love when you said so willed to win, so willed to win. I mean, you got a, you have a life now, a life of winning, right? <laughs> Hailing out of Flint, Michigan, a life of winning. If we were to sit down with your current team, if we were to sit down with Ish or Laura Lawson <laughs> or the rest of the army at UWM, how would they describe the Mateen Cleaves of today? Oh, man. And, and it's funny because you see how when you mentioned them, how I lit up. Yeah. Man, oh, yeah. I, I just oh, yeah. love, love, love my family now. Yeah. I mean, they are such a, um, so, so, so great to work with. You know, I love each and every last person that you mentioned, any, each and every last person that walked through uh, those halls at UWM, and I just love them so dearly. Um, but I, I would think it would probably be the same. You know, it, it would be the same. It's the guy that comes in smiling, you know, excited to be here, um, going out of his way to make others better, um, you know, gets a, gets a lot out of, you know, helping others, you know, empowering others and making others better. That's just me, you know. And uh, it's funny that you ask that because it's probably the same thing. It hasn't changed a bit from basketball to UWM. And when we're, I'm glad you said that because when we're together with mutual friends in relationships, that's what I hear, (laughs) right? That's, That's what I hear about you. They're like, dude, this kid went from the streets hustling at basketball dreaming about making it to the NBA, taking that through Michigan state, taking it to the league and now taking it to the boardroom. And he's still the exact same (laughs) kid. Let's hit on the childhood. You I've heard you speak publicly on main stages. I've heard you coach. I've heard you train to the concept of believing in the person in the mirror. And then it all starts there. Where do you think that came from early on in your life that got you thinking the way you still think today when you were a little boy? My parents. Yeah. yeah, My parents, my mother and father, and even more so my mother, man. Like, she would always tell me, you know, you are somebody. You know, you're going to be successful. And um, when I told her as a kid I wanted to make it to the NBA, she would always say, oh, for sure, you'll definitely make it to the NBA. And she always encouraged me to walk with my head high and stick my chest out and, you know, told me, you know, whatever you decide to do, you can do it. And it's funny because I had a teacher in school that would always tell me, he went out of his way to tell me, you know, there's only one in a million. Because I always would tell people, I want to make it to the NBA. Yeah, man. So he would always say, well, you know, there's only one in a million that makes it to the NBA. Um, And he actually put a sign up in his classroom. And said, well, there's only one in a million that make it to the NBA. And when he would talk to me, I lit up because he said one. And I, I would, and he thought I was crazy. I was like, <laughs> I got a chance. You know what I, mean? I like my odds. You know, yes. I have a chance to do something special. I'm excited about it. Yes. I never let him deter me from thinking of, of making it to the professional ranks. And, and my mother and my parents, they always encouraged me, man, to go after whatever it is. Um, you know, I sought after go. And you're going to do it, but it's all in you. And I I, I am very grateful and thankful that I had parents that instilled self-confidence in me. Um, That helped me out so much moving forward. So I I love hearing you acknowledge your parents because it it just, it's like no surprise that the family center at MSU is named after Francis Cleves, right? Yeah. Mama Cleves. Yeah. You know, can you share with our listeners a little bit about what that legacy is that she has there and 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 what it was like to watch her operate in and around the program and do things that would create this outcome? And what does that mean to your family? Uh, it means the world to us. And Manny, let me tell you something, man. She was a special person. 
I mean, everybody she touched, man. She, cha- I mean, she just she changed them, man. Like she, the yes. people just loved her. She gave the best hugs in the yeah. world. That's what I miss to this day more than anything. Just her hugs, man. But she was special, man. And she would go out of her way constantly to make sure every parent felt part of that team. Like she would. Um, I mean, if they would scrap up money back then because, you know, they didn't even have the NIL yeah. stuff. Oh, and man. So a lot of the parents, man, we were just – they was trying to make ends meet to get the different games. And she would always, you know, do whatever she could do and, and had little fundraisers and they would just pitch in and make sure everybody could go watch their kids play. And she was always, like, having, like, family meetings and gatherings. And, I mean, if it was a new player that came in, I mean, she would instantly reach out to their parents and, and make sure they come to the game and embrace them. And, hey, we're family here, and we hug around here, and we care about each other. We love each other around here. So I was on, on the basketball court, you know, as far as a leader and creating that family culture. But outside, man, she was great. And that's why she has a family center. That has nothing to do with what I did on the basketball court. That was everything that she did. And she wouldn't, wouldn't, she wouldn't want that family center if she mm-hmm. was still alive mm-hmm. because she just, that's what you do. You treat people the right way. Anybody she interact with, she made them feel like family. So she had a, she had a gift of that, man. And that's, that's kind of like far as my heart and wanting to help others came from my mother, man. But she was special. Coach Izzo texts me all the time. He'll just say, it can be one o'clock in the morning. He'll say, man, God, I miss your mother. You know? So it's, it's she had, she impacted not only me and my siblings, but Everybody she came in contact with, she had an impact mm-hmm. on their lives. And and I'm 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 glad you mentioned that. You know, I have heard that from other people now going into my sixth year living here in Michigan and being the steward of the firm. Um, I've heard many people who you played with. I mean, I'm thinking of guys like, you know, David Thomas and even mm-hmm. my brief engagements with Charlie, like people have recognized the fact that you were definitely your mother's son. <laughs> And what she demonstrated was leadership and inclusion and wanting everybody to feel like they were a part of the team and that she was, she was really like the greatest teammate on the team for the families. And that's really what you did on the court. And so I would, I would make the assumption. I think it's an intelligent one. Tell me if I'm wrong, but that that's where you got a lot of that from that you took onto the court and they've taken on through your professional life. 100%. Yeah. 100%, man. It, it's always, I was raised that way. I mean, growing up, it would be people uh, from all different walks of life. I mean, I'm wake up and it be some people sleeping in our living room. I mean, she yeah. would go out and do whatever she could do to help others. She wanted to make sure everybody felt a part of family. She would give her last to help mm-hmm. others. And I think that's just what it, where it came from with me. And um, that's how I played the game. It was mm-hmm. never about me, man. I just wanted to win. And I got a kick out of seeing other people have success. And I love it now when I see people that I've interacted with and they go out and do great things or mm-hmm. just people I know. When I see your shows taking off mm-hmm. and, and read up Appreciate and, and see your business is, is, is killing it, that makes me feel good, man. Mm-hmm. I really get something out of seeing other, people's have, other people have success and other people grow. And yeah, you're right. It came from my mother. Yeah. I love that. Um, I, I want to get into the conversation of your journey to Michigan state and like how you you and your family selected that as being the place that you were going to just give everything you had for four years. Share, share with our listeners though, maybe one of your most memorable or fondest stories from your childhood growing up in Flint, Michigan. I, I still coming from the outside, looking in coming from Chicago, um, I get to Michigan. I'm completely unbiased. And, and every time I go to Flint, I'm like, oh man, this is the neighborhood I grew up in. <laughs> right. You know, it's just, yeah. I was in Illinois and Indiana growing up that way. Right. Yeah. And so it, it really is a place that I've grown to appreciate, especially through my good friends at Snyder financial who have an incredible practice base in Flint, Michigan. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of great history, a lot of great things that have happened and come out of Flint that have benefited the larger community and country. What's your fondest memory from your time growing up there? Man, one thing I know I love about Flint is we didn't have a lot, but we had each other. Mm-hmm. And like just as a kid growing up having sleepovers, you know, and we you know, come on over and we made sandwiches. My mom would make sandwiches or we had just enough food to feed some of the kids that was over, just sleepovers, nothing special, just guys hanging out. Mm-hmm. But growing up in the Flint community, I will I will give them credit for this. We always had stuff to do. 
always as far as um, sports and, you know, after school programs and uh, day camps in the summertime. We've always had things to do, man. I play like when I grew up, you played basketball when that was over you rolled right into football and then soccer was right there then you play <laughs> baseball and then you wrestled you ran track yeah we always had something to do man we had back in the day we call them community school directors and all they are athletic directors at elementary schools so huh. they had all these programs my loved them and gm back then they put a lot yeah. of money into the after school oh, programs sure. so we had a lot and man mr matt cab i'll never forget him he would come around in this red truck and our parents trusted him and loved him so much, he would just come pick us up. They, 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 they said, okay, go ahead. You know, he didn't, it was, okay, we're, this yeah. time we, we have a soccer game. We didn't know what we were going to play. And no seatbelts too, no, right? Yeah, no, no seatbelts, seat man. We in the back of the truck, man. <laughs> Anything could have happened. But Good. we were going to a different competition uh -oh. or a different camp. So we always had things to do as a kid. And we had very competitive leagues. Yes. So you played on, you didn't go... A you and do it. You played on the team in your neighborhood. Yeah. So I grew up playing against Charlie and Morris Peterson and Antonio Smith and Robert <laughs> Smith. I grew up playing against these guys, you know. Yeah. So we would just compete with each other, and um, I think that made us made us very competitive because you would have three or four hundred people at a kid's basketball game. And, like, the community would come out and support it. And if you were the top player in your neighborhood, I mean, you got treated uh, like yeah. a celebrity, man. <laughs> and then you would go play different kids from other neighborhoods, man. And you got three or 400 people there. It was a big deal. So just having, um, you know, different things to do and camps and after-school events and uh, the community helped raising each other, man. Yes. We poured into each other, man. And that's what made me, you know, very proud. And those are some of the memories that I remember growing yes. up in Flint. Toughest kid you ever played with in any sport growing up in Flint? Toughest kid. Toughest kid. Bites nails. Toughest kids. I would say it's a toss-up between Antonio Smith and Robert Smith. And these dudes are <laughs> brothers. Humongous. I mean, but you talk about tough as nails, man. Antonio, uh, man, he, this dude was so tough. And then Robert, I mean, they had their older brother, Fernando. And they called him, his nickname is Suge, like Big Suge. So this dude comes in and, this, I mean, he played 11 years in the NFL. Yeah. Antonio was a pro. Robert yes. played 10 years, 11 years in yes. the NFL. So, I mean, like, these dudes are so tough, man. And that's why – and I was I was lucky when I got to high school, I had them on my team because I, I didn't have to fight against them anymore. We got to high school, I could just go out there and talk trash and do whatever I could do because I had two yeah. big goons that were behind me that always had my back. That's it. And, yeah. they, and they were athletes. Oh, athletes, I mean, they were... man. Athletes, yep. Who, who was the most naturally gifted athlete you grew up with? In Flint. The most naturally gifted athlete I ever seen, Corey Hightower. And if you do some re this dude got drafted out of junior college. He was that good. <laughs> he was in the same draft with me and Mo Pete, but we played four years on national TV. And, you know, yeah. this dude got drafted out of junior college. And he was so skilled. And if you ask anybody that played in the NBA back in our era, if you mention his name, they'll say, ooh. And then his story comes behind it. Like, when yes. I was guarding this guy, he did this move and he did this. He was so skilled. Yeah. The game, that's one guy I would sit back and just watch. Yeah. When I was on the court with him, I just admired him so much, man, because he played the game with such grace. He made it look so easy. So I have to say, in our era, and he's a couple years under me, but the, the most talented player from our era is Corey Hightower, hands down. Love it. Yes. I want to give a special shout out to my friend, Dana Cornelius. Dana's the CEO, co-owner of Sporta Kings, the, the gear that I am rocking today. Yes, folks, I do wear more than a blue suit, white shirt, and a tie. Check out their website, S-O-K-F-Y.com. If you drop in the word podium in the discount code, they're going to send you an amazing, amazing, amazing package of whatever you order with 20% off. Check it out, Sporta Kings. Love Dana and Tiffany. Take our listeners through the, the decision-making process and the journey of you choosing Michigan State and coaches. Up. Oh, man. I'm glad you asked me that because I think now it's been so long ago, I think people just figure, you know, Michigan State was the school to go to. 
right. It wasn't back then, and Michigan State wasn't the cool school to go to, especially in the state of Michigan. You know, I was one of the top players in the country. I was, you know, arguably one or two best point guards in the country, either me or Mike Bibby. It just depends on who wrote the article. Mike Bibby. But um, top 10, ranked seventh overall. And, you know, players of my caliber – didn't go to Michigan State. Back That's then. right. They did. Yeah, no, Michigan absolutely. was the for sure. And you went to Michigan. I, you know, when I look at the roster um, on Michigan team, they had seven or eight McDonald's All Americans oh, yeah. on that team. They had for sh- for sure pros yes. that was on their team. So as a point yes. guard. Yeah, that's an easy decision for me to make. Oh yeah, I should go there. Yeah, you know, coming right after the Fab Five and everything. I one hundred percent. If that makes my job easier, then you riding the hype after the Fab Five. Yeah. That's basketball wise. That's probably was the easy decision for me to make. But yeah, I'm from Flint, you know, so <laughs> I like things. I like the challenging things. And um, but I will say this: one thing that helped Michigan State was I grew up a Michigan State fan. Yes, my father was a big Michigan State fan, and, and it meant. Uh, a lot to my father that Michigan State was one of the first schools that recruited black athletes. So that that hit home with my father. So in Michigan, in our household, we watched a lot of Michigan State yeah. football or basketball. Then we had a lot of people from my area, um, Andre Risen and uh, Lonnie oh, Young man. and Carl Banks and Mark Ingram, oh, Courtney Woo! Hawkins and uh, Je- uh, Jeff um, T. Green. And uh, I mean, we had so many of these people um, – that was from our area that went to Michigan State and had a lot of success. So it was like, man, I Heck growing yeah. up watching all these great players, man, Daryl Johnson. I, I know I'm gonna leave some people out. I hate it. No, yeah, but it was so many right. greats. Um, Jay Green, I said T Green, I meant Jay Green, um, great one of my heroes growing up watching him play in high school. But it was a platform I mean, to go to Michigan State because a lot of Flint guys had went there. But for me, man, it was, it was Coach Izzo, man. I, I, I yes. Coach Izzo recruited the heck out of me, man. Like he was at everything. He was at all of my basketball games. He was at all of my football games, football practice. Uh, if I was playing in a three on three basketball tournament, he was there, man. He he should have paid rent, you know. <laughs> he, he was at our house so much, man. But uh, uh, it was and, – and Antonio Smith and, had went there in Morris Street. They went there a year before Yeah, that's before right. Me. They were ahead of you. Um, Robert Smith, his, his brother, played football, my best friend to this day. He uh, he had committed in football. So it, it was hard. It was hard to say no. Steve Smith, I was a big fan of his growing yes. up. He was my favorite basketball player ever. He still yeah. is. Yeah, to I was going to say, who isn't yeah, still, right? Yeah, Steve yeah, Smith, Motor City smooth. Smith. I love that dude, man. One of my big brothers. But um, so – it wasn't it wasn't as easy as I thought because I always liked Michigan State, but then when I kind of you know blew up blew up yep. you know going into my senior year, I started being recruited by everybody, any college you can imagine. You know I was being recruited by it, um, but it was just that love of Michigan State growing up, man. I, I really enjoyed them, I, I loved them, um, but and not, not one to ramble, but like people don't understand that wasn't the cool choice. I went against the grain. Like, when I went to Michigan State, they didn't have, you know, and no disrespect to anybody that was there, but it was nobody, like, I'm figuring I could just pass the ball to and get an assist. Yeah, right. If I went to Michigan, it would have been like that. Yes. If I would have went to Syracuse, yeah. Cincinnati, you had these yeah. guys Be already. flipping the ball behind your back. 100%. And, and it's, it was easy, but I went against the grain, man. And I, I said, well, let's do it the old-fashioned way. You know, I was ready to roll my sleeves up and go win a national championship, and people thought I was crazy. You know, back then, it was two people probably really saying it. You know, when I first went to Michigan State, and it was myself and Coach Izzo that really probably believed, was crazy enough to believe that we could win a national championship at Michigan State. Yeah, your elementary school teacher who told you one in a million was not definitely one of those two, right? (laughs) Right. No, no, no. (laughs) No, no, no. That person was not the one. (laughs) I'm hearing two things, though. Aside from the incredible tradition of great athletes, and I love that you mentioned Carl Banks because I, I... Carl, I'm obsessed with bringing Sutter back, man. Like in a mean, <laughs> mean, vicious way yeah. in every league. Yes, sir. I mean, why? You know, not just the NFL, man. Sutter should be back in every Everywhere. league in the country. Yes, sir. You know, so anyways, I, you know, mad respect to Carl and everything he and Ty Hopkins are doing with Sutter. But I hear the power of the influence of a parent that you love so much and your dad's, you know, love for Michigan state. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I also hear, secondly, I hear the fact that you wanted a challenge. You wanted a challenge. 
Coach Izzo is one of the greatest recruiters of all time, man. We can't even talk about the war for talent with Coach Izzo. I mean, this guy, this guy's in the middle of Michigan, yeah, out recruiting ninety eight percent of the country. Like, forget about it. That's a story in its own. That that's yeah. a ten hour story, right? <laughs> that's a documentary someday down the road for Coach Izzo. But yeah, but like the love for your dad and watching him say like, Hey, this is a school I really respect because of what they're doing for the black athlete, mm -hmm. for the families, giving them an opportunity to really showcase their skill sets, but also the fact that you love a challenge. Mm -hmm. Tell me where else that sort of love and respect and admiration that you've had for your parents, where else has that played an impact in the decisions you've made in your adult life? Oh man, all of them. so many, right? Yeah. But is there one that stands out, a story that stands out that you say, hey man, here's another example of like how important it is to be dialed in as a parent and passing on your thoughts, your values, your love to your children. Yep. I think what they've done for me, what they did for me, makes me a better father. Um say more about when that. I, when I look, because I, I you know, I get busy and it, and you yeah. you know how yeah. it is, man. We get pulled in so many different directions. Yep. But I slow everything down for my son. Mm -hmm. I got two boys. I got one that's 24. He work at Amazon. He's killing it, doing great. Yeah. Love him. He's fantastic. But I got a, I got one still in the nest. And right now, man, I clock out of work, and then I clock back in to be a father. That's it. And I love it, man. And, and, yeah. and I get such a kick out of yeah. being a father because my father did. My mother did. They love being parents. Yes. So for me, I love being a parent. And I just think back, what would my mother do? Well, like, okay, if I'm tired and my son, I just got back in or I've been flying around or I got to drive two hours to an AAU tournament, I'm yes. just drained, tired. What would my mother do? She would she, go. She would show up. She'd it be the first one there. 100%. What are we talking about? Yeah. You know, so a lot of stuff um, in the care, because I challenge my son. I challenge him like none other because I know this world is going to be hard on him. Yes, but I is. love him so much. And I tell him all the time. Now, my mother, she was the lover. She would hug me, love you, kiss me constantly. My father held me highly accountable, but he he wasn't he, military background, mm -hmm. came up, uh, uh, you know, tough um, from humble beginnings. So he he challenged me more, and I didn't hear I, I love you from him as much. Mm -hmm. but I heard it from my mother all the time. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do is find that balance, is hold mm -hmm. my son highly accountable, but I love on him so much, man. I let him know I care so much about him. Mm -hmm. and, and, and everything that I do, it's a why behind it. It's something yeah. strategic behind it. Yeah, I'm going to challenge you, man, because you said you want to be successful in life. That's you right. You think that's just going to happen? No. Yeah. No, and it's not going to just go your way, and you're going to be challenged, and you're going to go through so much adversity, man. You got to you gotta embrace that, and you got to take it on. But like I said, I think I get away with it, with challenging him, because you know I love him so much. Yeah. And that's that came from my parents. Yeah, and Mateen 2.0 has handles and a shot that, <laughs> that would rival rival yours at that age. Am I, am I right or am I right? You, it, I hate saying it publicly because he, he, he's, he's probably to. better than me um, <laughs> at this age. Mateen 2.0, you heard it right here. <laughs> Your dad he's, admitted it. He's much more skilled than I was at this age. But I'm trying to put that, you know, I tie it all together, the leadership, the work ethic, oh. you know. Um, so he was here only this one time for me he said he's a little better because I don't like to tell him that. I like to challenge him. But he is working hard. He's he's a good kid and he's working hard. So he'll have a chance to, to be successful, whether it's sports, whether it's life. Yes. Because I'm trying to instill those things that it takes to be successful. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And I think that's, uh, well, first of all, he is an absolute assassin at his age on the court. <laughs> I, I've seen some reels and some clips and I'm like, oh my goodness, I, I'm failing my poor Atlas at the age of 12. <laughs> I might, but, but yeah, I'm trying to teach my baby boy how to play middle linebacker at Country Day. Okay, right? there you go. So um, I do love seeing that. I mean, he's such a special young man. Congratulations on that. You, Thank you, you, your family deserves that. I mean Thanks. that. Um, that's a good pivot, though, to the conversation about Coach Izzo and your time with them. I mean, you go from accepting this opportunity to say, like, okay, we're just going to walk up a much bigger mountain than most teams need to mm -hmm. to get to the championship, and you get there in 2000. Yeah. What are a couple of the moments or or stories that you can share that would help our listeners really understand what it looked like to come into the program at that time and build a championship in such a short window of time? Oh, yeah. You know, when I first got there, the expectations were nothing. Nobody were talking. They was not talking about Michigan State basketball. The respect wasn't there. 
Uh, teams would come play us. It was, you know, it was it was nothing. And when I first got there, and I mentioned this, I was speaking on um, Draymond's podcast, and I, yes. and I and I was talking about when I first got there, I had to change the mentality. There were there were there were there were, there were guys that was used to losing, and they were okay with that, and that rubbed me the wrong way. So that's the first thing I tried to change was the mentality and still confidence in everybody that was there and, and let everybody know, hey, man, we're going to work. We're going to work. You know, it's, it's a tall glass to feel, but we have to be willing to do it. And I was personally willing to do it every day. Coach Izzo at the time was willing to do it every day. You know, we, we had each other's back. Um, I think me and Coach Izzo helped each other grow because he was a mm -hmm. second-year coach that was still trying to figure certain things out, make adjustments on the fly. Um, as far as the, the confidence um, factor of it, I brought that. From Flint, you have that. As soon as you get out of the bed, you believe in that person <laughs> that just that put them feet on the ground. You know, so that's how I was raised. So I brought the confidence. And, not, and another thing I brought there is not being afraid to fail. Let's mm -hmm. just go, man. Mm -hmm. Let's compete. Whatever, it don't matter. So what? Let's go. We're going to compete with anything that we do as a competition. When I got there, we, I started, we would, I started said, we're going to keep track of wins and losses in the open gym, which meant nothing years before. They would just, <laughs> man, I'm telling you, it was just to go get a sweat, man. Just uh, go get a sweat. I said, screw that. Yeah. If we're taking a score, there's a winner and there's a loser. Yes. So we're going to keep track of that. Yes. Now, what that did was start, people started getting agitated. The game started getting a little more chippy. Yeah. They were more competitive because people didn't want to be the laugh and stop, you know, at the end of the day. If I won six games, you only won one. I'm telling you, hey, man, shut up. You yes. know what I mean? You can't talk in this conversation. You only won one game yeah. today. And little stuff like that started changing the mentality. And now you start building winners. And when, when winning absolutely meant nothing in that environment, years before that, now it's important. I, I I love the message there. And what I'm taking away from it is that in any environment that we want to be competitive and we want to win in, like you got you got to keep score consistently. Yes. You have to just always keep score. Yeah. Right? Yeah. If you want to win in the game, yeah. you got to keep score and work to win in practice. 100%. Yeah. I love that. Um, tell me about, I've, I've spoken to Coach Beeline. A number of times, and we've spoken about leadership. Yeah. And he always references the tone at the top. Tell me about what the tone was at the top with Coach Izzo at that time. Oh, man. Um, like, when I first got there, it was just work, 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 work. That was it. You know, we, we don't have as much talent as everybody, um, so we got to outwork everybody. So yes. that, that's what it was. It was, the, it was you got to work, you got to compete. Um, and as we continue to grow, it, we grew more into a family, you know, and he talked about family and caring oh, yeah. about your team members and going over and beyond for your team members. He would always get on me, um, when I first got there because I was a workhorse, I would go in there and work. I didn't mind working, but he would say, Hey man, you going to bring somebody else to the party? You know, <laughs> we lost, to, uh, I had a great year. My, my sophomore year, man, I got over my injuries and I got healthy. Yes, I worked you hard. Did. All-American, Big Ten Player of the Year. Yes. Anything you can accomplish as an individual. So we lose in North Carolina, and I'm sitting there pissed off in the locker room. He said, well, why are you so mad? I said, well, I just feel as a team, we didn't compete. We could have played better. He said, well, how can you get mad at these guys when you walk by three of their dorm rooms and then take them to the gym with you? You got better, but you didn't bring nobody else to the party. That's right. He only had to say that to me one time. The following years, it was not just me in the gym. It was seven or eight people in the gym. And that's when we took the thing to the next level. But Coach Izzo, man, it was all about that hard work, family, culture. And that's how we started to get things turned around at Michigan State. I love it. What do you think when you look back at that national championship season? I mean, so many things came together. So many moments came together to put that run together. It's, it's literally one of the most special stories that I've, I've listened to a few dozen times during my time here in Michigan of any school, any professional sport, <laughs> any team, doesn't matter. That run that y'all went on that year and winning the national championship was so special. What's, what's something specific about that time that you can share with the listeners that you say this moment or this memory or this sort of general theme came together and that's what made it happen? I would say will to win. Love it. That whole year we had the yeah. will to win. Nothing else meant nothing. It was get over. Where we I broke my foot at the beginning of the season. Yeah, I remember so, that. 
other guys had to step in. And then we had a tough schedule. I mean, we played Kansas. We played North Carolina. We played had a, a very tough schedule, but other guys had to fill in. Yeah. You know, we had games where it was tight, and the guy that usually didn't play, he had to step in and fill those shoes. Um, but it was like we had a group of guys that loved each other, believed in each other, that had each other's back. Yeah. In that whole season, we would do whatever it took to win. And I remember we were playing Syracuse, man. We were down – Double figures at halftime. Yes. And, I mean, I went in there and I was creating havoc. I was a riot. I mean, Coach Gizzo didn't have to say a word. Oh. I was grabbing guys. I was yeah. throwing chairs because this is our opportunity, man. That's it. And you know what? The crazy thing about that, as crazy as I was acting, nobody took it personal. Yeah. We answered the bell. We went yeah. right back out there, second half, boom, caught um, uh, Syracuse and beat them. Same thing. We got down to, to Iowa State. But there was no panic. It was always yeah. the will to win. We will figure it out at some point. Okay, we got to knuckle down and get a few stops. Okay, we got we to gotta focus and get a few good possessions and get some good opportunities, uh, some easy shots at the basket. That's, that was our thing. We never, ever felt we were going to lose a game. It was always, okay, whatever we have to do to win, but it was that will to win that kind of drove us um, to win a national championship. But it was two moments, that Syracuse game and that Iowa State game, where we probably, the majority of people would have lost those games. Yes. But we just pulled each other up and came together and found a way to pull it off. I love it. All right. So national championship, another another trophy on your resume, <laughs> another damn trophy on your resume. And you're starting to look at the league. Mm -hmm. Do you remember draft night vividly? Oh, man. I will never, ever forget draft so, night. So wa wa walk us through that Listen, moment. I would, I would say draft day. Draft you know, day. That day yeah, yeah, you're yeah. talking to media a little bit. Um, your family is in town. It was uh, in Minnesota for me. Back then, the draft would travel. I think now it's just in New York. But um, – and I don't I'm getting old. I don't yeah. know what it is. But yeah. back then it was in Minnesota. And, oh, man, my whole family was in town. Um, I remember uh, I was freaking out because I had got a tailor-made suit, but it wasn't done yet. It wasn't ready. And I'm like, oh, my, where's my suit? I didn't get my suit probably to a few hours before the draft. So what? I was yes, I was freaking <laughs> out. And I was thinking I was going to have to go buy something off the rack. Uh, and I'm like, man, no. no. Man, I'm from Flint, man. I Ooh. can't walk up there with something off the rack. We would all known, too. Yeah, we would all know. would known, man. So <laughs> the suit finally gets there, man. I'm putting on my little tailor-made suit. My name is on the inside of it. My family is there, man. And I'm just, I was just, like, levitating that whole time. Yep. And then you go through all that hotel, you know, getting dressed. Family's there. Um, then you get to the draft, man, the green room. Uh, you're sitting back there. You're looking at – it's just – the energy is just like none other. It's like success is just in the air. Yeah. Everybody's back. Their life is going to change That's it. when the name get called. And you got number one projected pick, Kenya Martin. And you got Marsh Peterson, who I grew up with. We oh, both sitting there at the same time. And you got Jamal Crawford and Quentin Richardson. You got all these great players, man, that's going in that draft, man. Um, sitting there and it with their families, man. It was, it was. I mean, Darius Miles, he was coming out of high school. Deshaun Stevenson. I mean, I'll go on and on about these guys. If I miss anybody, sorry. I love everybody that was there. Yeah. But it was just so magical, man, because you're sitting there and you're moments away from living your dream. You're moments away from playing in the NBA. So you're sitting there and now the draft starts. And, and what happens is when you're getting drafted, you know it's your time because the cameras start coming your way. That's right. Um, so I'm sitting in the green room um, with my mother, father, uh, my girlfriend at the time, which is now my wife. She's been fantastic. Uh, my brothers, my siblings, man, everybody's there. And, um, you know, I was a 14 pick, so all these picks go by. And Detroit Pistons is up. Like, this is the team, man, like, I want to go to. Yes. I grew up watching the bad boys, Isaiah Thomas, Joe Dumars, all these great players. The, I mean, Detroit bad boy team, Chuck Daly, all of everything. Yeah. And the camera starts coming my way. And I'm like, oh, my God. This is unreal. Here it is. And, you know, with the 14th pick, the Detroit Pistons select, 
my team cleaves, man. I just, <laughs> I thought I was going to cry, but I was so happy, man. I just lit up. I was hugging everybody. And Krista Chin, I love her. I just saw her not too, at Draymond's wedding, too. You always watch her. She's the one walking people up, you know, yes. to the stage. And yes. she, I was just hugging her so tight. I was just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, putting on my hat in Detroit. Yes, yes. I'm coming home. And, you know, I'm sitting there. I'm, I'm excited because I'm not thinking about just winning. I mean, or just being drafted in the NBA. I'm thinking about everything I went through before I got to that moment. Shooting in the backyard with my brothers on a crate. You know, play, you know, shooting at the park. You know, three, two, one. You know, Cleves hit the game, winning shot. And sitting there watching the NBA draft with my father every year. And he, when he's in, even as a kid, he would say, are you, you know, you're going to go to the NBA? You know, he would ask, yeah. me, you know, you know, are you going to the NBA? Do you believe you can make it to the NBA? And he, and then he would, you know, go on to say, man, you, you, you'll make it to the NBA. But watching the draft, man, with my brothers and every year now, that moment is here. You yeah. Know? And that, that was the best feeling, man. It was, it was a few great feelings in my life. That was one of them. I love it. So you get into the league. <laughs> You played against some of the baddest dudes, right? That we've seen play basketball, right? And look, the guys playing today, like Draymond and LeBron, and that, I mean, they're special, mm -hmm. right? Steph Curry, special. Luca, yeah. oh my goodness, Luca gave his shoes to Atlas last year at the end of one of the games. I was, I was like, <laughs> what? I wanted to touch him. You know, um, who was your favorite player to play against because he was so tough to play against? Man, uh, or name a few. I, I have to. Yeah, please. Um, Gary Payton. Oh uh, man, and he talked so much. Oh. There's actually Ooh. a picture out on the internet with me and him looking at each other because we had <laughs> we had some some words. You know, he he challenged you, and I was sitting there thinking, I can't believe you know I, I might fight. You know, like Gary Payton, like this is my, <laughs> one of my favorite players growing up. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm like, saying. Yeah, I'm probably gonna fight this dude. You know. <laughs> Um, so you had Gary Payton, you, Jason Kidd. Oh, uh, man. man, he was so hard to guard, man. He made the game look so easy. Um, Allen Iverson, you know, playing oh, against him. Man. I mean, it's like everybody's, you know, think about, you know, can I stay in front of this crossover? Yep. And no, you can't. You know, it, it was different. Um, then you look at, um, you know, Kobe Bryant. This dude, he was so good. He was so much better than everybody else. And I just think... He don't get the, the credit he deserved when you when you talk about the actual greats. Man, he was fantastic. He, yeah. To me, he's the closest thing to Michael Jordan. The closest thing to Michael Jordan ever. I'm sorry. He was that good. Um, so playing against him was always fun. Um, and then I got an opportunity to play against Michael Jordan. He retired and came back. So that was like just a dream. I couldn't even sleep the night before the game. <laughs> he was with the Washington Wizards. I didn't even warm up. I was uh, watching him. Yeah. I was watching everything he did. Like, yeah. you don't get those moments. Yeah. You know, and to be able to play against a Michael Jordan, um, that that was unreal. You know, yeah. it was it was um it was such an honor and a blessing. That's one of those pinch me moments, you know, it's one of them, God thank you. You yeah. know, I mean, take me now. I mean, I, I what else can I where where else can I go from here? Yeah. Um, so having an opportunity to play against Michael Jordan, that was that was great. I uh <laughs> You just made me think of this reel that I love of C.T. Fletcher's where he says, you know, you know, you're always told, hey, there's always a badder dude. Oh. There's always a badder dude. And he says, no, nah, mama, but I'm the baddest. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Is that is that the mindset? Is that the mentality you took with you into the league? And, and what do you think? What do you think are one of the things that you took from your childhood college years that served you really well to have a long career? I think the competition of it. You got to okay. compete. You yeah. know, I, and for me, I respected them guys so much because I grew up watching them, and I was a fan. But, well, I got to stop being a fan because Gary Payton just rolled past me. You know what I mean? So I got to lock in, and I got to get ready to compete. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, not bagging down from them guys, you earn their respect. Yes. Because everybody can play on that level. And, yes. I mean, you you got some, some people that's a little better than others. You got yes. some of these, you know, generational players that come around every so often. And you got some people that's really, really good. And then after that, man, you just got a big pop of oh. professional basketball players. Yeah. You know, and you, ho you hope that you land in a spot where your skill set can be utilized. But it's so competitive. And mm -hmm. I tell don't back down. These older guys, they're going to talk trash to you. They're going to try to intimidate to you, intimidate yeah. you. 
But when you stand up and you fight, you earn their respect. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I can always walk around and hold my head up. I didn't have an all-star career, but anybody that I played against, they'll tell you, well, he didn't back down, and he was a competitor. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I hold my head on, and I tell my son all the time, because nowadays these kids, they play for rankings. You know, I want to mm -hmm. be ranked. Oh, gosh. You play for respect. Yeah. That's that's it. Yeah. Just rank, screw rankings. I, mm -hmm. I know enough people to get you ranked, if, that, if that's mm -hmm. what I want to do. All they do is call somebody, and they'll do a favor for me. Mm -hmm. Nah, man. You play for respect, and mm -hmm. that's how I always, when I played in the NBA, that's mm -hmm. all I wanted. Mm -hmm. I want to respect for some of my heroes mm -hmm. that I watch play. Mm -hmm. You know, when they see me out and about to this day, like I mm -hmm. said, I didn't have an all-star career, yeah. but I'm respected. Yeah. Because the way I carried myself and the way I competed and everything that I've done, injuries, uh, situations, ain't no need to harp on that. It's life. That's right. But one thing I did, I competed in everything I did, and I carried myself with, yeah. with, with respect, and I got respect. And that gave you how many years pro? I played six years in the NBA, and yeah. I ended up playing 10 years total. Yeah, I mean, yeah. unbelievable, right? I mean, mm -hmm. what a, what an incredible career, special, yeah. top 1% yeah. of 1% and mind you, of I, all players. And I should have said this earlier, people don't realize I broke my back in high school. I was never, ever uh, the athlete that I That's was right. in high school. So I, now I'm just using this yes. and pure toughness yes. to kind of get by and find a way. You yes. know? So I was never the athlete, but hey, yes. you got to find, you got to just find, you got to will it to happen. Nobody cares about that. And, and I know that you've consistently had a reputation from your childhood to college through the pros of always being one of the greatest teammates. People have consistently recognized you as saying like, hey, dude, whether he was on or he was not on, which was rare that you were not on, you were still the, one of the greatest teammates on the mm -hmm. floor in any given night that you played. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit maybe about the moments where you didn't perform like a greatest teammate. Do you have a moment, do you have a series of moments or experiences that stand out from your playing career that you say, man, I, w I wish I could take that back. I wish I could have done that differently. You know what? That's a great question. And you know what? I actually corrected it on the fly. I was playing in Sacramento. It was the first time in my life that I, I wasn't part of the rotation. I wasn't getting a lot of playing time. Yep. And my, one of my best friends ever, Mike Bibby, oh, is, was starting yeah. point guard. Yeah. Bobby Jackson, that was my guy. He was the other guy. And what happens in the pros, if they're playing great, then you just you just sorry for you. I don't care what you're doing. You're hanging. We're winning. We got a good thing going. Yeah. And at first, I was like, well, I want to play. So you could easy the competitor in you kind of not want them to play so well because <laughs> you just want to get on the court. And uh, then you know what was crazy, man? I, it, it, it bothered me so much, I had to pray about it. I prayed, man. I said, no, Lord, please don't let me think like that. Yes. That's not it. You know, and then I became, I was like their number one, like fan. Like I would push them guys and practice and challenge them because I wanted the game to be easier for them when the game came. Yeah. And then pushing them, I would, I was ready. So whenever I played, I played good, but it wasn't no minutes. Left. I mean, you got Mike Bibby and Bobby Jackson who are playing, who had two of their best career, best yes. years yes. when I was there. So I found myself going down that rabbit hole and no, that's not me. And I checked it and I caught it. And it's funny because I I ended up having like an impact on the team when I and I when I didn't play that much. I was one of the leaders on that team, and I didn't play, and that's rare. Yeah, nobody listened to a guy that's not getting a lot of playing time. Right. But I had such a um, a way about myself because they yes. first of all everybody on that team knew I loved them and cared for them yeah. and wanted them to have success. And me as I as a team, I want to win a championship. Okay, so what can I do? to help the team. What's my role? Well, my role is to come in and, make, and and compete against Mike Bibby and Bobby Jackson every day and make sure that they're the best they can be. Compete against that first team and make sure that they're the best they can be so when they play in an actual game, it's easy to win. Yeah. So that was my role, but man, I tell you, it's funny, I went down that path and I caught it because that's not me. Yeah. You know, I checked it right away and then I, I got got myself back together, man, and then I was just the ultimate, once again, got back into my role being a great teammate. Yeah, and I, I love that you share that, and, and thanks for being vulnerable and open yeah. about that because, you know, it just makes me think about how often I hear you say, get your mind right, right? <laughs> get your mind right, yeah. right? You know, focus on what mind. matters and obsess about what you can control. Yes. Are you comfortable sharing, like, when you knew it was time to pivot? Yeah. What was that like? What yeah. happened? Is it is something you happened, or was it a series of things that occurred that made you say, okay, it's time. Like, I'm going to keep playing, but I'm not going to keep playing and get paid for it. Yeah, it was I, – I knew it was time. I went to a um, training camp with the Denver Nuggets. 
had a great training camp. I mean, the coach, I was talking to the assistant coach, and he was saying, hey, whatever you're doing, keep it up. Yep. Because you're the topic of conversation in these coaching sessions, in our coaching meetings. So I'm sitting there thinking, like, okay, great. You know, here I am. And it was a team with Carmelo Anthony, Allen mm. Iverson, Kenyon Martin, uh, a lot of J.R. Smith, a lot of great players. But yep. I thought they probably could have used a little leadership uh, on that team. Yeah. Um, and George Carl was even telling me, man, you love what you're doing. Oh. Um, and, the, and the veterans that was trying to make the team, it was a guy, Smush Parker, who had a heck of a run in the NBA. He was a point guard. Uh, Juwan Howard. Oh. Uh, Ruben Patterson. Yeah, coach. Um, it was like five, six guys that had real, you know, legit career, legitimate pros. Yeah. Um, that were trying to make that team. And they ended up just having budget cuts and they didn't keep anybody. So they cut me, but they said, well, I want you to go play to the NBA Developmental League. And we're going to, you know, because don't go overseas. We're going to keep our eye on you. Yeah. So went down to the NBA Developmental League and broke my thumb. <laughs> and I ended up playing a few games with it taped up. Um, and finished the year out, but I said, it's it. Because what I felt, I wasn't getting out of it what I was putting into it. And I just felt I got much more to give to the world. I can be successful in whatever it is I want to do. Yeah. Um, I just had to put that same grind that I used to put in basketball. So at that moment, um, I, I when I felt I wasn't get out of, getting out of it what I was putting into it, yeah. that's when I decided to walk away. Leadership coach at UWM. Mm -hmm. Like I think of you as I and I, look. It's not. It's not to disrespect or dilute or take anything away from the other great leadership coaches at UWM because I know there's a few <laughs> others. But like you know, the world sees you as the leadership coach at UWM. Thank okay? you. Okay. Yeah. And I mean that sincerely. When did you know that that was the next step, the next path for you? Um. And 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 I, and I have to give somebody credit before I even. Please, to this. please. Um, Mike Curry, he was my veteran. Uh, he's still a big brother to me when I got in the NBA. He told me, he said, you have a gift. He said, you'll be more successful outside of basketball. <laughs> and I was a rookie in the NBA. I wasn't yeah. trying to hear You're that. Like, whatever. <laughs> yeah, like basketball. Bro, let's, let's talk basketball. I'm about to break ankles right exactly. now. Exactly. <laughs> let's talk basketball. I don't. I'm not even thinking about that. But he he said it's something about you. He said you'll be much more successful outside of basketball. He said just wait and see. But um, far as the leadership coach um, at, at UWM, man, like I take pride in that. Yeah, I take pride in that. Like I want, like like. I want to make people better. I want to help people grow. I want to empower others and see them just strive and be the best. And when Matt lobbied me and came to talk to me about coming there, yes. I said no at first. He was like, oh, I'll just give you time. You know, I want you to think about <laughs> it because I'm thinking mortgages. Ah, yeah. That's not my deal. Um, but, I mean, the lane that he's created for me, at UWM, one of the most successful companies in America right now. That's We're the right. best at what we do. I don't want to say that, you know, cockiness, but just confident. Yeah. And I'm just happy what the success we're having. But he he he's created he created a position. Come in. And he, he just he said, Hey man, I want you to come in and make my leaders better. That's all I want you to focus on. Yes. Because when I got there, I started looking around. I'm saying, Matt, oh, I like this. There's a lot going on. What else can yes. I do? And he was he started laughing. He's like, I knew you would say that. But he said, right now, I just want you to focus. I want you to be the, the best leadership coach. And, yes. I, and it was cool for me because basketball, you got roles. So in this big this big machine we have, okay, my role is lead, make our leaders better. Yes. Do whatever I can possibly do every day to pull the greatness out of our leaders. And then what they'll do is turn around and put a greatness out of our team members, and we'll continue to win. So I embrace that role, but I, I really get a kick out of you know meeting with our great leaders, and and and, and you got to you have to be crafty with it because you got some some of them that's already great leaders. Okay, that's right. And I that's might right. not have to teach them nothing. So those days I might just listen. Yes, they might just want to you know get some things off their chest. You yes. know, I don't go in looking like I got to coach everybody up. And then some days you got some people that need to be coached up. So you got to kind of have a feel for it yeah. in the conversation. But I, I am a leadership coach, but I love I love to be able to support our yes. leaders, you know, and kind of yeah. feel it out. And I, you know, like, and, and people were probably looking at me like, what do you know? 
I didn't know anything about the mortgage yeah. industry. I'm sitting here talking to some of our top, top executives in our company. And I'm sure they're saying, well, what do you know? And what I did just, what you should do is build relationships with them, build a rapport with them. All right. Now, maybe the second or third time I open up a little more and they'll, they'll open up more than me because I, I built relationships with them. I didn't come in thinking I knew it all. Yeah. Talking at people. No, yeah. no, I'm not here for that. I'm here to support you, man. I'm here. If you are great, then let's take it to another level. You know, and that was my whole thing. But I love it, man. Matt Ishbia, man, to create that position for me, man, I'm telling you, every That's special man, every company in America should have a leadership development team. I'm telling you. Yeah, and and I and I I want to I want to walk back your humility a little bit and really come at this a little bit more aggressively. Mm -hmm. I mean, United Wholesale Mortgage is the number one <laughs> wholesale lender in the country. Yeah. By yeah. by football fields on top of football fields on top of football fields on top of football fields of a margin. Yes. Right? Yes. It it's near it's an army of nearly 10,000 humans strong. It Matt, and I know I called him Ish earlier. Sorry about that. Matt Ishbia <laughs> has built one of the greatest corporate campuses I've ever walked into in my entire life. And I'm a 44 year old man and I've seen many, right? I mean, I work for Mass Mutual. Yeah. They have an incredible corporate campus yeah, sure in Springfield, Massachusetts. So I, I mean, you're the leadership coach there. I mean, dude, it's, it's like, it's like an army of assassins. It's like you're on a crusade. The culture, it's not, it's not fanatical. It's, it's like obsessive, like unflinching commitment to the cause and to the teammate next to you. Am I wrong? 100% right. What's the tone at the top that creates that? Matt, it starts with Matt. Matt Isby is special. He, to me, and I'm a little biased, but is the best CEO in America. <laughs> This dude, he he. First of all, his heart is pure as gold. He he is the absolute perfect person to be in a position that he's in because all he wants to do is help others. Yeah. That's it. He talked yeah. about growing a broker channel and helping others grow their business. That's legit. It's not a sales pitch. This yes. dude is always thinking about how to help others and how to help help you grow your business or help you grow um, in 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 your wheelhouse. And 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 he's so humble. You don't see a CEO as successful as he is walking around campus, coming in job shadowing other people, oh, coming to have lunch with 100%, every teammate. Hundred percent. Like, come on, man! You don't see that. Like this dude has created something special, but it starts at the top. Yeah. He's humble. He cares about others. His work ethic is unmatched. So everybody has to be a good person. We yeah. got to care about each other, and yeah. you got to work hard yeah. because it starts at the top. But what he's created. And it was, it ain't happened overnight. You know, he just kept no. building and building and building. But to, hands down to me, the best CEO in America. But, you know, he's taken the concept of the aggregation of marginal gains, right? Like step by step by step. by. He's taken it from the aggregation of marginal gains and created an environment where it's like the aggregation of ast astronomical <laughs> gains. Yes. Like, I'm just like, dude. How do you create returns and growth at that rate in this environment that we've been in, especially the last three to four years? Right. What is it do you think about Matt and the entire executive team that just makes them such a unique force and really unique compared to other corporate teams that I see in America? The, 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 the way they care about people. And we talked about Matt and gave him a lot of credit. Yeah, unpack that. I gotta more. give his dad some. You know, his dad yeah. and his mom, because it yep. started with them, man. He's wired that way. Just like my parents and certain mm -hmm. things that I do is because of them. Man, he has great parents. If you meet mm -hmm. his parents, man, you'll mm -hmm. fall in love with him. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, man. But they our our executive team care about our team and family members mm -hmm. like none other. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, man. They go out of their way to make sure our team members feel appreciated. Our family members feel appreciated. That's it. Mm -hmm. That that's that's what it is. They understand that because mm -hmm. if I feel appreciated, then I'll run through a brick wall for you. Mm -hmm. I'll come in and give you everything I have because I feel appreciated. Yeah. And and so so they care they care about our family members like none other. But they they work tirelessly. They they I mean they work tirelessly. They work work work. Yeah, for that constantly. They for work that. for the for the family member, and yeah. we know that. 
they want to be ultra successful. And they're not telling you to work hard. And they're not, I mean, they're, they get there two or three hours before everybody else. Right. You know, and, right. and the position I'm in, I got to get there early, get ready, get the that's day sad. going. And that's just how we're wired there, man. And everybody is pushing each other, holding each other accountable, but loving on each other as we do it, um, as we're going along. But the thing that separates us from plenty of other companies, man, we are a family. We genuinely have a love and care for the person that's sitting next to us. We're going to go over and beyond for the person that's sitting behind us. And that's that's something that really separates us from a lot of different companies. And, and I see that reflected in uh, the demand for people who want to work there. Right. The lines out the door. I hear the lines <laughs> out the door. You know, when, yeah. you know, the brief encounters I have with Laura Lawson, I keep saying, hey, I, I need to come and be an intern for a day. It's like I got to compete with 10,000 other kids for internship at UWM right now. But what 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 are two or three of the things that UWM looks for in the people that it wants working within its home on the team, on the family? Good person. Yep. Hard worker and a team player. That's, That's it. it, man. That's it. That's it. I tell people, <laughs> if you want to come here, all you got to be is a good person, a hard worker, and a team player. Yeah. And you will fit in here. We'll train you and coach you once yes. you get here. But yes. we look for good people, hard workers, and team players. That's it. That's all we ask. Yeah. And and I do. I'm, I'm glad you said that. It reminds me of Matt's book. And, you know, just going from the court to the boardroom yeah. and, you know, his the success that he's shared about all the different people and all the different things that have happened and the folks that have come together to pour into him to help him build UWM to where it is today. He reflects back on his time at Michigan State quite a bit, right? Yeah, he does. And at, I, I think of the story that you said um, when you were in Sacramento and the role you played then for the team mm -hmm. to help the team win. Matt probably had somewhat of a similar role and similar experience during his time at Michigan State, right? 100%. Yeah. That was his role at yeah. Michigan State. And, and I thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. This is Matt. You know, Matt challenged us and pushed us and made us the best That's we right. could be. It was simple for me to make the transition to do it. Same thing. Yeah. United Wholesale Mortgage, five years from now. What's the vision that you think for UWM five years from now through Mateen Cleve's eyes? Man, definitely, you know, be the number one overall lender. But I, you know what? I can't even put us in a box. Mm -hmm. like if I said something now, I would that yeah. would be putting us in a box. Yeah. And Matt is so out the box. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, he's so yeah. out the box, man. He's, I'm sorry. I I don't really have an answer for you because we, you know, it changed just like that. Yeah. You know, we can have a goal, man. Matt will change it. it you know, three weeks later, it could be something different. So I definitely, you know, being the number one overall lender, that's for sure. But Man, I, I can't even put us in the box. I don't I don't know. Yeah, the possibilities are limitless, yes, right? Hundred <laughs> percent. Yes, sir. As we get ready to wrap up, let's let's contribute something to all the young men and women who are either coming out of college looking to earn their first position with an incredible team and company or folks looking to make a career change. Give us two to three of your best pieces of advice to young professionals who aspire for greatness, live their greatest life by design, and be a great impact player where they work. Oh, man. First of all, it starts with self-confidence. You Love have it. to believe in yourself um, and willing to overcome adversity. You know, everything is not going to go your way. So that confidence, you got to have that. And then the willingness um, to overcome some of the challenges, that's that's going to hit you in the face. Yes. and Because what that is is life. It's just yeah. called life. And then the work ethic. That's it. My favorite saying is get your mind right and keep your grind tight. You have to work. If you want to be successful, you control that. That's it. And it's your effort. That's like now we're looking for the shortcut. Everybody's looking for this shortcut. It's something to be said for that good old-fashioned work ethic. That'll never go out of style. I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, you, you welcome new classes at UWM, right? You're yes. part of that. Yes. What's, what's one of the things you say every time you welcome a new class? Aside from mindset, self-confidence, getting your mind right, is there any other thing that you really want to impress upon new people as they enter UWM that other companies should be wanting and expecting from their folks too? First thing I always say is welcome to the family. I mean, and yeah. I tell them I say that not because it sounds good, because I mean it. 
Like, welcome to the family. That That's the first thing come out of my mind. But um, something I always challenge, challenge anybody with is that willingness to overcome adversity. Mm-hmm. It's going to hit you. Mm-hmm. All right? Embrace it. Embrace it and grow from it. All right? Having that pity party, I say it all. It ain't no fun at that pity party. You're the only one there, and they ain't playing no music. Okay, so you don't want to have that pity party, but that willingness to overcome some <laughs> adversity, to me, I think that mental, that mentally, that ment- being mentally strong, I think that's something, man. If you can control that, I think that's a, a recipe for success. I love it, Mateen. Forty-five minutes flew by, man. This oh, was special. I man. always enjoy being with you. You poured into me. You poured into our listeners. Um, I hope we get to do this again and get a 2.0 going soon. We definitely going to do it. And let me say this while I got the time to say it, man. Thank you for what you're doing because yeah, I watch you. these and we and we all grow from them. You know what I mean? And for you to to, to put this put this platform together, man, and where people can look and, and grow and get better from it, kudos yeah. to you, man. You the man, yeah. man. Thanks. Keep it up, baby. Thanks, my team. Folks, thank you so much for listening. And thank you to my guest, Mateen Cleves. For more info on Mateen, you can find him on Instagram at t- and Twitter at Mateen underscore Cleves, C-L-E-A-V-E-S, Mateen underscore Cleves. If you like what you heard today, be sure to follow us, rate and review at the podium on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And look, you can follow the show on Instagram at Podium Podcasts and or YouTube at the podium with Manuel Mesqua. Post about the show on social media and tag us. We'll repost to share our gratitude. Also consider telling a friend about our show. Friend of friend remains the best way to get the word out about our podcast and these incredible conversations. I hope this episode provided a few meaningful tactical lessons that you can take away to become the greatest leader and the most confident leader you can in your life. We'll see you next time.